part two of what will America's hyperinflation look like and can it even happen? Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching Yankee Stacking. If you haven't seen part one of this two-part series, just stop right now, go back. Uh, I'll put the link in the description. You got to check out part one. This is this is part two. This is uh, you know a continuation. I'm going to talk about the likelihood of hyperinflation occurring today in America. And I'm also going to talk about some really big changes that I think are coming that will not only make hyperinflation much easier, it will just be a sea change in how we approach uh, the economy as a whole. So again, if you haven't checked out part one, check it out. But this is part two, and I'm going to dive into it right now. Could hyperinflation actually happen? Well, the common thought is that we have a very proactive Federal Reserve, a central bank that would never let the past mistakes of other countries happen here. We would never make those mistakes. I mean, come on. You're talking Venezuela, Argentina, you know, Zimbabwe. Give me a break. Those are banana republics. We are America. We have the trust of the world. We, we, we have the reserve currency of the world. In order to buy oil, you have to buy it in dollars. Everybody wants our debt. What are you talking about, Yankee? It just can't happen. The Fed is also thought to be so monetarily sophisticated that they know what knobs to turn and what buttons to press. They can take care of us. Everybody just Relax, Yankee, relax. Yes, we are America. I am so proud to be an American. There is no other country I would rather live in than the United States of America. And in large part, the world financially does revolve around us. The dollar is the most powerful currency in the world. I get that. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge patriot. However, I'm going to state it right now. For anyone to think that we are too big to fail, that nothing could ever, ever unseat America as number one in the world economically, that is just plain, unadulterated hubris. Pride. Now, I am proud of America. I'm proud to be an American. But to have that kind of thought is d just grotesque to me. That's like those in the Roman Empire sitting back and just thinking, look at us. This empire is so vast. We're so awesome. Nothing could ever cause this empire to fail. <laughs> well, there was a lot of things that caused the fall of the uh, Roman Empire. I'm not going to talk about that today. But I am going to talk to you about this Atlantic article uh, by Matthew O'Brien. And it's back eight years ago in uh, 2012. And, you know, it's, it, it's fun to look back eight years and, and see what the, you know, pre-medical crisis mindset looked like. Uh, I'll put the link in the description. Feel free to read the whole thing. But here it is in a nutshell. When faced with the question, could America suffer hyperinflation? Mr. O'Brien says, no, absolutely not. For three main reasons. One, we don't have any problem selling our debt. Two, we are not actually printing money. And three, the United States is a highly productive economy. Now, I'm going to respond to each one of those points by Matthew O'Brien. And at the very end, you are going to make the call of whether you believe hyperinflation 
is possible in America or not. Number one, we don't really have any problems selling our debt. Really? Hmm. Well, from where I sit today in 2020, I take issue with that. Over the past few years, some countries like uh, Russia and China have actually been reducing the amount of U.S. debt they have. China trimmed its holdings to the lowest amount held in the last two years. Now, they have roughly $1.1 trillion in U.S. debt. Uh, <laughs> if you, if you uh, saw my uh, last video, which I hope you did, uh, frankly, that number just doesn't sound so big anymore, does it? <laughs> it you know, with the debt, the numbers we've been hearing, you know, $2.2 trillion, all that, it, 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 it just doesn't sound like a lot that China has $1.1 trillion in U.S. debt. It is a lot of money, and, uh, you know, it's nothing to sneeze at, but they are no longer the number one foreign U.S. debt holder in the world. That dubious honor goes to Japan, who struggles with negative interest rates, so pff, anything looks good to them, right? Now, much uh, digital ink, if you will, has been spilt <laughs> over the possibility of the U.S. defaulting on China or uh, China dumping its U.S. debt. It's called the nuclear option. It's something you may have heard about in the news. I mean, you know, the administration right now is like, uh, they came out and said, uh, uh, we're, we're not going to do that. that. That would be unwise. Well, just stating the uh, possibility, uh, even if they think it's not likely, is really risky. Uh, not only could China, but the, you know, the whole world could look at that and go, whoa, 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 you're thinking of defaulting? You're, you're actually contemplating that? And that could have serious repercussions. The point is, we are in a death grip, if you will, right now with China, okay? And the likelihood of China, you know, dumping its treasuries seems un unlikely, right? However, there's a few points that I want to say about China. Number one, China hates hates how we've weaponized uh, the dollar over the past you know, 15 years or so. China also is working really hard to open up other avenues for trade. It's the reason that they really put all the emphasis and, and, and money around the Belt and Road Initiative. It's all about breaking the reliance on America's debt fuel consumption and the uh, trade imbalance that we have. China has worked really, really hard at increasing this, <laughs> gold, all right? They are uh, amongst many nations that are uh, you know, repatriating and, and growing their stockpiles in gold. Now, they're not going to come forth and tell us exactly how much they have, but we have uh, a good estimate on what their holdings are, and it keeps growing. China has absolutely... No qualms against abusing their populace. Their, their communist regime knows how to subjugate and control its people. And they are far more apt to allow them to suffer, you know, if, 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 if they did break that grip, if they decoupled from America. The suffering would be great. But you know what? I, I, I had a friend uh, years back who was actually in Tiananmen Square when the crackdown occurred. He told me that... Uh, he had to really contemplate whether or not he was going to do what his friends did and step up on top of the box that they had there in the square, take the microphone or the uh, bullhorn or whatever it was, and start talking about the injustices of their country. Because he knew the moment he stepped up to take that mic, he would probably be whisked away and never seen again like some of his friends were. And if it hurt them to decouple they may be willing to do it. Finally, they don't actually need to dump U.S. treasuries. All China really has to do is, is um, simply hold shorter and shorter and shorter term notes. And then just not buy more when those notes mature. They don't have to actually sell anything right now. Not yet. <laughs> and you know, I believe that the cycle 
of our consumption with China's IOUs, you know, that, that death grip, you know, we buy, they take our IOUs. That, I think, could actually be broken easier as a result of this medical crisis we're in. And, you know, the severe recession or depression that we uh, could be going through soon. So if we cannot or will not consume at the same rate that we've done in the past, where would the debt go? Where, where would that debt go? Well, the answer is actually really simple. That debt would go to the Federal Reserve. The Fed is already the fastest growing consumer of U.S. Treasuries. And I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. In fact, I think it's going to get a lot worse. When a country starts to buy more and more of its own debt, the more like a banana republic it becomes, the more likely it's going to experience hyperinflation. So that's the, uh, you know, my answer, if you will, to that uh, first statement uh, by the author. The second uh, argument that he makes is that we're not actually printing money. Not like war-torn Hungary, back in 1945 at least, nearly half of Hungary's productive capacity had been wiped out. Its infrastructure had been obliterated, literally, <laughs> by bombs. You know, and the government at that time wanted to, you know, rapidly rebuild its lost capacity, get their people back to work, but they couldn't afford to do it. So they did literally run printing presses nonstop. They hyperinflated their currency with actual paper money. Now, I don't think the author here is trying to be cute. Okay, you know, we're not we're not literally running printing presses like hungry. You know, these are just, you know, bits on a computer screen. And all it takes is someone at the Fed to sit down at a keyboard and type a few zeros in and it's done. Boom, there it is. <laughs> no, what he says is quantitative easing or money printing, quote, involves the Fed buying longer term bonds from banks. It simply swaps one asset for another. In this case, cash for longer term bonds. Unlike Hungary, the Fed isn't directly paying the treasury bills. This is a hugely important distinction. End quote. Well, first, <laughs> when it comes to quantitative easing or QE, I think it's a distinction without a difference. The Fed is still increasing the money supply. It's still monetizing the debt, regardless of the treasury maturity games it's playing with bonds. But, but second, we are paying the treasury's bills now. <laughs> We're paying it in spades. Where did that money come from? Well, in normal times, that would mean, you know, selling two trillion dollars in treasury bonds and bills on the open market but who has two trillion dollars of extra income lying around okay who wants to use two trillion dollars to buy treasury debt well that's a good question but i already told you the answer the fed they are now buying all the debt that the treasury is selling all of it and more because of this medical crisis, the Federal Reserve launched a series of actions that they said was to, quote, support the smooth functioning of markets. So they, they, they did a few things. They vastly expanded their repo operations, essentially providing unlimited amounts of cash to whatever bank needs it. Uh, they lifted uh, bank regulations temporarily, and they started buying hundreds of billions of dollars of mortgage-backed securities municipal bonds, even junk bonds. And who knows, who they may be buying corporate stock. His argument about money printing is a moot point, in my opinion. The Fed is printing money, and it is all in on paying whatever the Treasury needs paid. So that's his second argument. And his last one right here. He says the United States is a highly productive economy. 
I guess that depends on how you define a highly productive economy. What do we produce? Really, think about it. What does America produce? Don't get, don't get triggered now. But the answer is very little. This, 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 is, this is my buck knife. I received this knife when I was a young man from my mom and dad uh, for a birthday. I love this knife. It's filleted quite a few uh, fish that I've caught over the years. It's a great knife. All right. Um, it was made, and I mean completely made, in the U.S. back then. But amazingly, 85% of buck knives are still made in the U.S., it, depending on the knife. Uh, I think they, they continue to uh, buck the trend. <laughs> and, you know, and, and they're working really hard to try to bring more and more production back to the United States. I applaud that. All right. That, that's fantastic. But that's the minority, folks. Okay. We, we really don't make much anymore. I remember my dad used to say, I'm not going to buy that Chinese stuff. <laughs> well, now that's pretty much all we buy. So what we produce is primarily services, financial services, especially food and agriculture and, you know, other products too, you know, military weapons, um, you know, and other financial products. There, there really isn't a lot of manufactured items in America. Most of what we produce, at least from a manufacturing standpoint, really is just assembled here in America. We are professional consumers, folks. And that is a big reason why we have such a huge trade deficit. So let's, let's go back to the author's statement. He says, quote, the most important difference between us and post-war Hungary is that our roads haven't been raised to the ground and half the country isn't striking. It's very difficult to have hyperinflation when you still have a functioning economy. So it, it certainly appears that we have more than just a functioning economy, but in many ways, behind the curtain, it's highly dysfunctional. And the author of this article obviously didn't have any idea how dysfunctional it was going to become now in 2020 due to this uh, medical crisis, but actually more due to the response by our government and the Federal Reserve. Now, here's the big gotcha, guys. The viability of what we are doing, what the Fed and the government are doing right now, depends completely on a short recession, a V-shaped recession. It has to happen or we are really up a creek. As I alluded to earlier, the Fed is you know, printing up something like a trillion dollars per month. If the recession ends up being an L-shaped recession, which is what I believe it is or gonna be, those numbers will ramp up big time as reservoirs of private cash dry up. You know, a few large companies are going to need bailouts. A few more dysfunctional markets go to the Fed. They start buying everything. You know, banks start failing. It just snowballs. Right now, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, wants $1.2 trillion to bail out emerging market economies. State and local governments they're already facing a pension crisis. They are going to be toast when sales and income tax receipts collapse. It, it's going to take more bailouts. Every state is going to be lining up for them. Now, the author also says, quote, almost all the examples of hyperinflation result from huge economic shocks that devastate an economy so much that leaders think printing money is the only solution to growth. Um, okay. He goes on. <laughs> he says, uh, and again, quote, 
As bad as the Great Recession has been, our GDP is already back to and above its all-time pre-recession high. As bad as unemployment is, more than 80% of the labor force is working. I'm going to comment on that uh, second point first, that uh, 80% employment rate. Yeah, it's probably going to 60% soon, maybe lower. It's already the lowest employment in history. And GDP, it's toast, people. It's now lower than it was during the Great Depression. Also, when when you talk about GDP, it's important that you also include debt. You got to factor that in. The best way to do that is to look at the U.S. debt to GDP chart. Check this out. Man. We're going to leave, we've left 100% GDP behind. Our debt is going way up. You can see what uh, was originally, uh, you know, estimated for uh, the debt to GDP. But now with this uh, medical crisis, it's, it's just going to go right through the roof. So do I actually think hyperinflation is coming? Well, admittedly, hyperinflation is much less common than inflation and That's a good thing. But the short answer is yes. Heck yes. Right now, our Federal Reserve and most central banks around the world like inflation. They really do. They they have no problems with prices going up and up and up. And the value of our dollar going down continually, shrinking. They have totally drunk the Keynesian Kool-Aid. They... They think that, 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 that having an iPhone cost much more now than it did back in 2010 would, that would be a great idea. That's awesome. Let it cost more. Yeah. But that's yesterday's news, folks. The reason I think the Fed is going to lose control of their pretty little 2% average with inflation is due to the recent recklessness sparked by the medical crisis. They have thrown all caution to the wind. And the mindset of the the, the White House, the the Congress, you know, the Fed, and even Americans of both parties has radically changed. Guys, we, we are embracing big government now. No one's concerned about, you know, bailouts. No one cares one bit that we are entertaining socialism, full bore, completely. Nope, it's no biggie. It's a sea change. And here's the big risk. This, this is the thing that I predict is going to completely bring hyperinflation to, to, to life in America for real. I predict the new wave of central banksters are going to enter the scene and they are going to preach that hyperinflation is absolutely nothing to be scared of. That's right. It's just fine. I'm talking about modern monetary theory or MMT. It's a teaching that is just out of fantasy land. It teaches a whole new generation that we can spend all we want and not give a rip about national debt, deficits, trade imbalances, whatever. It just doesn't matter anymore. Print all the money you want and then some just for fun. Money's not circulating around the economy fast enough. No problem. We got that solved. Is all the money the Fed printed stuck in some bank somewhere? Nah, don't worry about it. Now, the bank's not lending. Spending not happening. Here's the answer, folks. MMT. You know, just screw the big banks, right? And their special relationship with the Fed. Forget about it. Same with the bond markets. No, no, no. Forget that. We'll give cash directly to any and all public or private institution, company, individual, anybody. We'll make it easy, too. We'll do it digitally. We'll create... Uh, 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 a wallet right on your mobile phone. Bam! You'll have cash. Want more? Bam! Here's some more. No problem. You don't spend it fast enough? Well, you know, that balance will evaporate unless you spend it by Friday. Yeah, 
it might cause hyperinflation, but what's the big deal? <laughs> we'll keep it under control. All you have to do is tax it into submission. Yeah, that's right. You heard me. Taxes. That's the answer. Let me give you an analogy. Actually, I'll, I'll uh, tell you the analogy that Stephanie Kelton uses. She's the uh, chief economist for Bernie Sanders. Uh, and she's a leading MMT proponent. She explains it this way. She uses a bathtub metaphor. The spigot of the bathtub is the federal government. The water coming out of the spigot is money. The tub is the economy. And the drain is taxes. According to MMT, when the federal government needs more money, I should say currency, <laughs> it simply turns on the water by contacting the treasury, which then contacts the Fed, which then credits the federal government's account at the Fed for that amount. Okay, simple. The, the, the government then spends the money any way it wants in the economy. To continue the metaphor, that's the water filling up in the tub. Now, there is only so much space in the economy for that additional currency, just like there's only so much space in the tub for that additional water. With all the money pouring in, <laughs> the risk of hyperinflation just, just goes through the roof. But to calm everyone's fears and to manage this, according to MMT proponents, the government taxes money out of the economy as it is necessary. That's the, that's the drain. You just pull the stopper, down goes the water, no more problem. That last point, the draining of the water, taxes, that's huge, folks. The idea is that the government isn't collecting taxes to fund programs anymore, but to manage inflation. But that is insanity. It only works as long as there is any confidence in this stuff. All right? When that goes, it's over. This is a confidence game or a con game, if you will. When the confidence crumbles, no amount of jacking up the printing or, or filling the tub and pulling it out with, you know, you know, with taxes is going to work. Hyperinflation will be the final stage of our economic collapse. That's the end game, guys. That is it. You know, that's why I am stacking. Again, I really didn't show much, but uh, <laughs> these are my uh, these are my ice cream cones over here. Some pretty stuff. Love this stuff. I love that oriental border there. Man, there's some really beautiful silver items. Very nice. Love my, you know, poured silver. I love this. These are some of the more numismatic uh, you know, proof or uncirculated silver pieces that I'm collecting. You know, I love I love channel rounds. I got to get some more here. Sal, salivate metals. Uh, there's just just another average stacker made this for me. I mean, really, that these are fun items, right? This is this is collecting, yeah, collector stacker. Or maybe I'll flip a few of these things, yeah, <laughs> if the price goes up. Yeah, collecting, flipping, prepping, stacking. This is why I'm a prepper stacker. This is the end game, guys. I hope you appreciated this part two of my uh, series on hyperinflation. If you did, like subscribe, maybe share it, both of them, part one and part two with people that you know in the community. And as always, I hope your day is a-okay.